So this is the tibial checkpoint. That's the femoral checkpoint. So Dr. Edmund, this is not a fixed point or you don't have to put any pin or anything to determine these fixed points? Uh, I, I put a, so I put my tibial pins outside of the wound so I can still uh, have, have the software program when I have the real implants in. So I, I put a small hole in the tibia and I use the femoral pin for a checkpoint on the femur. So I just took the hip center there and right now I'm collecting the ankle center. The computer is going to calculate the midpoint between the malleoli for the distal aspect of the mechanical axis of the tibia. And I'll have an assistant hold the extensor mechanism out of the way and I'll start taking points on the tibia. So the top of the mechanical axis of the tibia will take a, something in the center of the footprint of the ACL. Uh, this is an imageless system, so no CT scan or MRI required. And then I'm taking points on the medial and lateral tibial plateau for resection levels. And then you also, you, you define the AP axis and the slope of the tibia. So you don't yeah. have to map the entire surface of the bone in this system. You have to just register some points. How is, how yeah. The tibial registration is actually quite simple. Uh, it's, it's five or six points. You define the mechanical axis, you define the axis for slope, and then you define resection levels on the medial and lateral plateau. And here I'm, I'm painting the femur. So you, you paint the distal condyles and the posterior condyles. Uh, the computer takes 200 spots along the condyles to define the most distal and most posterior aspect. And then you run the pointer along the anterior cortex of the femur so that it knows where the saw blade will exit for the anterior aspect of the, the femoral component. So my, my research assistant is filming this uh, with an iPhone. And right now, I'm just confirming that the registration that I took, I think we'll turn the screen here in a second. So on this, on this screen, I'm confirming that the points that the computer has chosen are, in fact, the most distal and posterior points on this patient's knee. And so you can see there's kind of a cloud of points. And, and I'll run my pointer along the bone to make sure that there's no points more distal. Uh, than what I've collected, or most more posterior than what I've collected. Just basically verifying the model. Sorry, that screen could be tilted better. How much distance you accept, like 0 0.1 millimeter to one, uh, what's the difference except for those points? Yeah, there's, there's a couple things I'm checking. One that I didn't, I didn't step on the pedal while the probe was off the bone, so I didn't collect any error, uh, you know, an air ball or, uh, you know, a point that's not actually there. And then I'll accept anything within about 0.2 to 0.4 millimeters. Okay. So once I've um, verified the model, then I'll collect soft tissue data. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm putting some retractors in so that I can remove all the osteophytes around the femur and the tibia. What's your alignment philosophy? You always go for a mechanical alignment or you do some kinematic adjustment with this and how easy it, uh, it is with this uh, robot uh, to do a kinematic alignment if at all one has to do it? Well, for, for, I, I use patient specific alignment and we can elaborate on that if, uh, if, if you'd like. Uh, people that are kinematic alignment uh, can also use this robot very easily because it you're mapping cartilage and bone, and I think you can understand the anatomy and the knee quite well. I, I think that the robot's tailored to whatever alignment philosophy you like to use, because you're going to get data on the topography of the femur. I like patient-specific alignment, um, and so I will, uh, I think this patient's in a little bit of uh, varus, and so I, I, I'll correct this knee in a little bit of varus. But basically what I've done there, I've removed the osteophytes, and now I'm collecting soft tissue data on the medial and lateral side of the knee. And so for me, my background, uh, before kind of adopting this system, I had done a couple thousand Mako knees using patient-specific alignment. And so I still use a very similar workflow. Uh, other people do this very, very differently, but 
What I'm doing here is I'm capturing, I'm, I'm putting tension on the medial collateral ligament in extension and putting tension on the lateral collateral ligament in extension. So what's the difference you noticed in MAKO and this system, what you now following? Well, several, di several differences. So uh, first thing is this is an imageless system. I think that's, the, that's one of the, the larger differences. So for me, um, in our, our work environment, I do about five to 600 knee replacements a year. And so to try and get that volume of CT scans and get insurance approval and get the CT scans to the operating room becomes a bit cumbersome. So with this system, I don't need to, uh, I, from an administration standpoint, uh, this, this makes that quite easy. Um, the, the cutting, you know, the soft tissue balance graph with the MAKO, you just collect points at zero and 90 degrees. With this system, you can see the entire arc of motion. So if you like to pay attention to mid-flexion instability or tension and deep flexion, you can see that. Um, the graph that you're seeing on the computer screen there on the right side, that's the ligament tension throughout the entire arc of motion. So I, and the cutting device, uh, this does not have haptic boundaries, so it'll keep you in plane, but you can, you know, as a surgeon, you can control the blade and, and and, and use it in any direction you need to, to to get to the outskirts of the bone. So I'd say those are the, those are some of the bigger differences. So what I'm doing here is I've, so I've now collected soft tissue data. What I like to do, I'm a cruciate retaining surgeon. So I also like to tension the knee in flexion with both compartments at the same time to make sure I'm not gonna run into uh, PCL tightness, what I was doing there before is collecting flexion data in each compartment as I flex the knee. Can you explain what just you did, what sort of instruments those have, you have, and what yeah, you did? Yeah, sure. So, just for simplicity, uh, if you want to pause the video for a second, that's fine. Just for, sim or, uh, just for simplicity, I use a curved osteotome and a Cobb elevator, which are two instruments I already have on the field to tension the flexion space. And I'm, I'm going back right now, and I'm I'm confirming that the numbers that I have on this soft tissue graph are in fact what I want before I make any bone cuts. So I'll test it in flexion and extension at least twice per case before I go on to plan the, the arthroplasty. In this system, the, there is a monitor that the surgeon can use, which is uh, draped sterilely there that I'm, I'm using. There's also a monitor on the far side of the room that uh, if you have a representative, they can help control implant positioning. So how big is the footprint for this system? Uh, it's quite small. Uh, it's, it was designed for, if you have a really small operating room, you can actually attach the robot to the bed and then wheel the cart out of the room. So you just have one camera and then the robot is attached to the bed. So it, it, it can essentially have almost no footprint. Uh, in the United States, we have, our, my ORs are quite large, but the, I understand from a worldwide perspective, there are folks that operate in a much smaller environment. So in this particular knee, uh, it did, from, like I said, I use patient-specific alignment. The extension space is actually quite balanced without much manipulation. Uh, after I tensioned this knee, the flexion space was wider than the extension space. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm adjusting uh, the components to try and get the flexion extension spaces to match. What I have found over time, so in this system, uh, the number 11 is the thickness of the tibial component. And for me, I, I, I try to aim for a six millimeter polyethylene in this system. So it's six millimeters of polyethylene and a four millimeter tibial base plate. So the numbers that I like to see in extension are 11. And then I will typically plan the posterior medial flexion space at 12 and the posterior lateral flexion space at about 13 or slightly above that. So, I've, you, I've, so you deliberately keep the lateral space slightly more than the medial space, is it? Yes. So when, when we first started using patient-specific alignment with robotics, uh, many of us would use a base, uh, an insol Kelly technique where the lateral side was the same as the medial side. And what we found is those patients had trouble with stiffness. So for adequate rollback, I think you wanna leave that posterior lateral space slightly loose so that the knee can roll back. It's, and anatomically, 
you know, as you're operating on a, a, a standard knee, that posterior lateral space opens up quite a bit in a native knee, and I think, I think we need to try to recreate that anatomy somewhat. So what, what, what I've done here, so those numbers are actually, to me, those are the numbers that I would like to see from a soft tissue standpoint. The problem is to get there, I ended up resecting 11 millimeters of distal femur, which for me is too much. I don't want to elevate the joint line. So what I'm doing, what I'm about to do next is I'm going to uh, distalize the femoral component, but to do that, I need to fill up the flexion space. So I'm distalizing the femur and I'm switching from a size four femur to a size five femur. And with anterior referencing, that'll close down the flexion space. You saw the numbers in the flexion space just went to nine and 10. So that's too tight. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking some flexion out of the femoral component, rotating around the anterior cortex to open up the flexion space to get the flexion extension spaces balanced and then I'll resect a little bit more tibia. So now I'm back to the, the soft tissue balance that I like. And to me, when I look at those numbers, I'm taking nine millimeters off the distal femur, which is about the thickness of the component. And I'm taking eight and a half off the posterior medial condyle, which is about the thickness of the component. So I won't lose any posterior condylar offset and my joint line will be appropriate. So once I have that plan, uh, the, rest, the rest of the case is typically very straightforward because now all I have to do is cut an implant. So I use a pretty uh, easy self-retaining retractor system. I don't like assistance around when I'm cutting because they can get in the way of the arrays. So I'll put a 90 degree Hohmann over the extensor mechanism on the lateral side of the tibia and a Z retractor medially under the medial collateral ligament. And then I can cut without any assistance around. I think I caught the drape here a little bit. And now uh, this is the distal femoral cut. So you let the robot come into plane. Once it finds its plane, engage the trigger. And then from a cutting standpoint, I've, I've had experience with um, Mako Rosa, now this, um, you know, this is, this is very similar to how you would cut using a, a cutting block or a traditional total knee, but the, the robot keeps the saw blade in plane. So if the leg moves during the surgery, how much play is uh, tolerated by the robotic arm? Uh, almost none. If, the, if, the saw, if you push on the saw or the leg moves, uh, the, it, the robot will cut power to the saw, so it can't cut. Is it haptic control, like, is it? It's, it's planar controlled, but not haptic bound. There's no haptic boundaries because it is an imageless system. Okay. So I've made the, the distal cut there. Now this will be the anterior cut. And then there's a foot pedal. Every time you push the foot pedal, the robot will rotate the saw into the next cutting plane. So now we're done with the anterior cut. So I make sure my Z retractor protects the medial collateral ligament. And then I'll cut the posterior medial condyle. And again, you can bounce the saw blade to feel the posterior aspect of the condyle. So virtually you don't require any assistant as such. I, over the years, I, I I now prefer no assistance around me when I'm cutting because I don't like them to move the leg and I don't like them to get in the way of the camera. So here's the posterior chamfer cut. Assistants all want to help, but they like to get in the way. and the anterior chamfer cut is here.
so when we go to the, the tibial cut, I, so a couple things happen. You have to recheck your tibial checkpoint to make sure the array is still where you planned it. And then I'll also move that Z retractor down under the, uh, I, we skipped a spot there, but the, the Z retractor gets placed under the medial collateral ligament on the tibia. It is, you can operate the saw with one hand, so I'll use the 90 degree homing to really pull the patellar tendon out of my way so that I can get to the lateral side of the tibia. Narendra, hello. Hello. In severe cases, do we have to do releases before taking the cuts? In severe deformities? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the question. Uh, there's a question from audience that uh, in severe deformities, do you do the soft tissue releases first or bony cuts? Or how, what is your protocol? So, uh, yes, for, so for something that I do patient specific alignment and I try to have a boundary. So we'll use a, a severe varus knee as an example. So what I'll do is I will put the femur in two degrees of varus. I'll put the tibia in two degrees of varus and I'll externally rotate the femur to get it close. Now, if the, if the deformity for me is not correctable within four degrees, then what I will do is plan the lateral side of the knee where I want it. And then I will do a soft tissue release on the medial side to catch the lateral side. So for me, I'll plan the lateral side of the knee for, an 11, for a six millimeter polyethylene. And then I will leave the medial side tight and I'll do soft tissue releases and until I catch the lateral side. So I'm still not ending up with thick polyethylene and have a reasonable resection. Does that, does that answer, the, is that okay? Does that answer the question? I think yes. So I, the bone cuts are made. I, uh, the video skips over the part where I remove the meniscus and then I, I put the trials in. I like to feel the PCL to make sure it's not too tight and deep flexion. Uh, in this particular knee, I think we'll switch to the the, uh, the camera here. When I'm in flexion, I'll rotate against the hip. I like to see the medial side be able to open up about a half a millimeter to a millimeter, and then the lateral side open up two to three millimeters, and then uh, the extension space I like tight. So this is the knee after I've cut. So the knee, I, I might have went a little too fast there, but the knee came out to full extension. Uh, it might have been in one degree of valgus. And then what I'm doing on the right side is testing this polyethylene thickness uh, and going through this graph. So I'll, I'll go back and I'll tension, again, the medial collateral ligament inflection and extension and the lateral collateral ligament inflection extension. And those numbers that you're seeing there are what the computer believes is uh, the, the gapping of the bone with the real implant in. And I like to see uh, about one millimeter of play on the, the medial and lateral side and extension, one to two millimeters and, and one to two millimeters in the posterior medial flexion space and two to three in the, the lateral side. There's a question from audience. Yeah, John, uh, so when you are using the saw to do the posterior medial and posterior lateral cut, uh, yeah. does the blade or saw stop as soon as you cut? And if you are going to go beyond the bone cut, say you are not damaging the soft tissues posteriorly. So does the saw stop automatically or you have the control over that? No, the, the saw will not stop. You have control over it. So uh, this, is, this is one difference between a CT-based system and an imageless system. You're not, you, you don't, the computer doesn't know where the back of the femur is. And so you have to use tactile sensation, just like if you're doing a manual knee to stop the blade, but you're, the saw, you're, put, you're, pull, you're uh, activating the trigger just like you would a regular manual saw. 